Well, good morning to you and a very happy Easter to you. Um, In many churches throughout the world, they say Jesus is risen and a congregation say hallelujah. So we can kind of, uh, now you know what you're meant to do. When I say that, you you can do it. If you want to stand up and put your arms in the air and shout out hallelujah, that's great. Uh, But it is the most momentous news that ever, ever happened in the world. Jesus is risen, to which you say hallelujah. Yeah, you've got the idea. Uh, Okay. So um, now you, you, you get the idea. It's not a kind of um, just uh, your, your first day at school just spelling out the word hallelujah. It is uh, over the moon, uh, thrilled to bits, hallelujah, shouting it out. Do it again, sir. What's that? Hallelujah. Absolutely right. Okay, see if you can drown this guy out. Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Excellent. That's good. Okay, we're, we're in, the, in the zone now for this morning. A very warm welcome to you. This is, if you haven't realized, it is Easter Sunday when we celebrate uh, that astonishing resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Delight to gather together to praise God for that. He remains the same. He continues to do wonderful things. And uh, for those of you visiting here today, uh, our pleasure to be able to welcome you in Christ's name. We do trust that you will know refreshment, encouragement, and blessing as we share together in our worship of God. Uh, There will be uh, goodie bags at the end uh, available at the welcome desk, and Karen and Hannah will be there. And part of their responsibility this morning is to, to make sure that you are a primary age child. Uh, if you are going for a goodie bag. These goodie bags are for primary age children. Uh, For some of you, that is going to be a problem to to kind of shrink back into primary age, but they are available at the end. Do make sure you pick one up at the end. And uh, let me also say to those of you who are joining us online, a very warm welcome to you as well. It's our our delight to be able to join with you wherever you are. I know some of you are the other side of the world, and we're glad to greet you in Christ's name, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, global in its dimension. So a warm welcome to you as well. The Apostle Peter uh, wrote this at the start of his letter, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That was the morning that changed everything. And we begin our worship this morning by sounding out the praise of God in the song, See What a Morning. Let us worship God.
Do you have a seat? And let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Living God, uh, you, uh, you do the most amazing, astonishing things. And from the, the very beginning of the Bible, you introduce yourself to us as the God who does things, the God who does astonishing things. And you make it clear that you do all things well, that you don't act randomly because you're wise, you think things through, you've planned things. And when we look out on the world that you've made, we can see something of the amazing way in which you do use your power to bring into being things that are full of beauty, full of wonderful splendor. We marvel at the sheer variety that there is in the universe in which we live, the remarkable beauty that there is, the wonderful order that makes us realize you are that God who, who's able to hold everything together. Sometimes it feels like our lives are just kind of falling to bits, and it's good for us to be reminded that you're, you're able just to hold it all together. But above all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. You sent him, you declare, into this world in order to do for us what we could never do ourselves. And we're glad today, along with countless others right across the globe and countless others down through history, to celebrate that which he has done for us when he died on that cross, bearing, you declare, our iniquities, our sins, our wrongdoings, in order that thereby he might uh, wipe the slate clean and, and enable us to enjoy a complete forgiveness. And it's a wonderful thing for us to know that you raised him from the dead, that he has beaten death itself, that nothing and no one is stronger than your son Jesus, and that with him we are indeed lastingly safe both in this life and beyond this life as well. And we're glad, therefore, to get our eyes back on that morning when you worked such a wonderful thing and raised Jesus from the dead. You commend him to us as the one who is risen, who is alive, who is in charge, who does know what he's doing, and who is well able to lead us forward in our lives and be our help and our enabling. And so we, we want to bring to you our praise. We want to lift up our voices with one another. We want to celebrate all that you are, all that you've done, all that you've promised, all that you will yet do and will yet be for us. And ask simply that you'd help us in our worship, that it may be pleasing to you, that it would gladden your heart as it flows from our hearts. And to that end, we'd ask for the help, please, of your Holy Spirit who alone opens our eyes to be able to see that Jesus is for real who alone stirs our hearts and prompts their praise and love and gratitude and wonder, and who enables us alone to bring to you praise and worship that is truly honoring to yourself. Help us then, we pray, that it may be a, an act of worship that brings glory and praise and honor to your risen Son, Jesus, for we ask in his name and for his sake. Amen. Now, in, uh, in a moment, we're going to read just a, a few verses from the Bible. Hannah is going to come and read for us. Uh, where's Hannah? Um, Hannah's going to come and read, and then when she's read the bit from the Bible, the words will appear on the screen so uh, you can follow. Um, uh, and some of you maybe uh, are helped to know, you can get an app for your, your mobile phone called uh, Uversion, um, and it's, it's very easily accessed, and uh, it enables you just wherever you are, as long as you've got a mobile phone, you can, you can access the, the text of Scripture, whatever language you want, whatever version you want as well. So Hannah's going to read um, from uh, the version that she uses at home, and uh, then after she's read, uh, Rose is going to come and uh, lead us in the next part of our worship. Hannah, up you come. Thank you very much. Today we will be reading Acts 2, verse 22 to 24. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man who had God's approval. God did miracles, wonders, and signs among you through Jesus. You yourselves know this. Long ago, God planned that Jesus would be handed over to you with the help of evil people. You put Jesus to death, nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead. He set him free from the suffering of death. It wasn't possible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. Amen. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rosie. I'm one of the Sunday school team here, um, and I will be leading us in the next wee bit of our service. Some of you might be eagle-eyed and have noticed that underneath your seat there are plastic eggs that look like this. They have numbers on them. Please don't open them until I tell you what number is needed, okay? I would really like it if you have the egg and you could bring it at the right time to the front and we could open it together. If you're an adult and would rather not do that, please pass it to a child that is near you and they can do that for you, okay? So who has egg number one? It is over this direction. <laughs> All right, Noah, you're going to bring it up? Bring it up. Jacob's coming to you. Brilliant. Right. Can you open it? And can you lift out what's inside it? What have you got? A donkey. A donkey. And what else is there? Hold it up for everybody to see. A leaf. So say it again. A, a leaf. leaf. So we've got a donkey and a leaf. Thank you very much. You can go and sit down again. Our story starts on what we know as Palm Sunday. If I can get the, the verses on the screen, Jack, that would be great. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, a foal of a donkey. And then in Matthew, next one please, Jack, it says, They brought the donkey and, and colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. That's why we've got a donkey and a leaf in the egg. The crowds that were ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the Jews who were there on this, what we now call Palm Sunday, on this day that it happened, the Jews would have known the prophecy from Zechariah. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day on the donkey, he was announcing, I am this king that you have been waiting for. He has arrived. The people were so excited and they spread their cloaks and they spread the leaves on the ground as Jesus rode in, just like they would do for royalty, for a king who would have come back victorious from battle. Who's got egg number two? Brilliant, here we go. Super Michael, thank you. <laughs> can you open it up and tell me what is in it, please? Turn around so everybody can see. What have you got? It's bread. Bread, perfect. Thank you very much. You. We've moved forward a little bit in our story. It is Passover time. And the Passover was the time that the Jews remembered how the blood of the sacrificed lamb had saved them in Egypt and how God had rescued them from the slavery that they were in, in Egypt. Jesus and his disciples met together in an upper room in Jerusalem for what we call the Last Supper. Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is like my body that's going to be broken. And he took a cup of wine and he said, this is like my blood that's going to be poured out. All this was going to make us right with God. Jesus transformed the Passover to the, into what we call the Lord's Supper, because he replaced the elements of the Passover with the elements of his death, with his body and with his blood. And just as the Passover lamb bore the brunt of the people's sin, so Jesus, our sacrificial lamb, was going to bear the full fury of God's fierce anger upon sin. The Passover lamb in Egypt had secured their freedom from slavery in Egypt. But Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, was going to do much more. His death would secure our freedom from sin and from death and all the slavery that that entails. But during the meal, one of Jesus' friends, Judas, he'd made a bad plan. He left because he had agreed to betray Jesus to the, to the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver. Egg number three. 
Who's got it? Brilliant, Santiago. Can you open it up for me? What have you got? You need to, I'll hold the egg. You can unravel it. Oh, sorry. So if you unravel it and hold it so that everybody can see. What is it a picture of? Praying. It is a picture, you're right, of praying hands. Perfect, thank you. After Jesus and his disciples had eaten, they left and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed to his father about what was going to happen. Now, God's rescue mission had been in place since before the beginning of time, since before the creation of the world. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And he knew how horrible it was going to be. He knew that he was going to suffer both physically and spiritually. And he prayed, is there any other way for your plan to happen? But he knew that there wasn't. And he submitted to what God, God's will was. This meant that he obeyed perfectly and he carried out the plan, even though he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew that God's rescue plan, that the mission could only be accomplished by his death on the cross. Remember Judas, the one who'd made the bad plan? Well, he arrived in the garden with a crowd that had been sent from the Jewish religious leaders. They had, they had arrived to arrest Jesus. And Judas had a prearranged sign with the crowd so that they would know exactly who it was that they were supposed to arrest. It was the person that he was going to kiss. That was the man that they needed. So Judas arrived in the garden with the crowd and he greeted Jesus and kissed him on the cheek. Then they arrested Jesus and took him away to be put on trial. Egg number four. Who's got that one? Perfect. If you open it up and see what's in there, what have you got? Turn, it, turn around so people can see. What have you got? She's got thorns and purple cloth. Thank you, Esther. Jesus had been handed over to the Jewish religious leaders who put him on trial in front of them in their court. They couldn't find Jesus guilty of a single thing. They didn't like Jesus because he claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God, and they had completely rejected this. They were furious at Jesus' claims to be the Son of God. They wanted him killed simply because he claimed to be God. But they weren't in control of the land. It was the Romans that were in control of the land, so they couldn't sentence Jesus to death. Instead, they handed Jesus over to Pilate, who was the governor, and they handed him over to be put on trial. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, it is as you have said. But to Pilate's amazement, when he asked Jesus about the charges that the religious leaders had brought against him, Jesus said nothing. He was completely silent. Now at this time of the year, it was custom for Pilate to release somebody from their sentence, to release a prisoner. The chief priests and the elders hated Jesus so much that they had stirred up the crowd, which was likely comprised of the same people who only a week ago had been shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they had stirred up the crowd so much against Jesus that when Pilate asked the crowd who they wanted released, they shouted Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a criminal and he was guilty of every single charge that had been brought against him. But the people had turned so much, their hearts were hardened, and they wanted him released. And when Pilate asked the crowd, well, what will I do with this innocent man, this Jesus? They shouted even louder, crucify him. So Pilate handed Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified. They stripped him of his clothes and put a purple robe on him like they would for a king. And they fashioned a, a crown for him out of big thorns and they pushed it on his head. Then they knelt before him and they mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they jeered. They spat on him and they beat him some more. After they'd done that, they put his clothes back on and they led him away to be crucified. 
We're going to pause there so that we can sing again. We know how the story plays out. It doesn't stop there. And we're going to sing a song that Sunday School, you guys know this one really well, so I know that you'll help everybody sing this well. We are going to sing one called uh, Lift Up Your Voices. Lift up your voices to heaven's king. Bow down before his throne. Our perfect saviour died for our sin. Hallelujah. Praise to Jesus Christ the King. So we paused our story where Jesus had been handed over to the Romans to be crucified. I now need egg number five. Brilliant, Deborah. Up you come. You turn around. Can you open it and see what's in it? What have you got? Lift out this one first. What have you got? A cross. Yeah, I'll hold on to that. And what else have you got? Some nails. A cross and some nails. Perfect. Yeah. Apologies to Jack in the box because I forgot to read out the verses before, so I will do this now. The verse for the cross and the nails is from, are found in John 19, verses 17 to 18. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. And the next one, perfect. It says, 
in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and, to, and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now, Jesus was so weak from the beating that he had received from the Roman soldiers that he wasn't able to carry the big heavy cross himself. A man from the crowd called Simon of Cyrene was, was the one that carried Jesus' cross all the way to Golgotha, the place just out the side the, the city walls of Jerusalem. And there they nailed Jesus to the cross, along with two rebels, one on his right and one on his left. And above Jesus' cross was a sign that read, the King of the Jews. That's what Pilate had put on it as the charge against him. Now, crucifixion is a long, slow, horrible, painful death. And while Jesus was hanging on the cross dying, the people that watched continued to mock him. They said things like, he saved others and he can't even save himself. Even one of the people that was being crucified with him said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But what they didn't realize was that Jesus could have got down off the cross had he wanted to, but he didn't. He stayed because he knew this was the only way to actually properly save people. It wasn't about saving himself. It was about saving us. You see, it wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for us that kept him there. It was about noon, about midday, okay? So think about the time that it's lunchtime in school, okay? This is about the time that Jesus was on the cross. And a horrible, terrible darkness came over the land and it lasted for three hours. So that's from lunchtime until home time of a school day, okay? And normally that time of the day is really, really bright and really, really sunny. Well, the day that Jesus died, it was dark. This darkness wasn't normal. This darkness was God's punishment. You see, this darkness was because Jesus the Son of God, who was God himself in human form. This Jesus, who, because he was perfect in every way, was God. This Jesus, who had had God's presence with him every minute of all his existence, right from the beginning of time, through to when he was born, and through his whole life on earth, God's presence had been with Jesus because he is God's Son. Jesus was hanging on the cross. And at that point, he was taking every sin, every wrong thing, every bad thing, but also every good thing that hadn't been done that should have been done. All the wrongs. Jesus at that point was taking them upon himself. He had been perfect and he was taking all the imperfect into himself. And because of that, God, who is holy and perfect and without sin, had to turn his back on his only son in punishment for the sin that we committed. And the darkness was God's punishment because God had to separate himself from Jesus. That's why it was dark. Jesus cried out from, an, from the cross in a loud voice, it is finished. He had done it. He, at that point, allowed himself to die. God's rescue plan had been accomplished. Now, at the very second that Jesus died, the ground shook and the rocks split because the full force of the storm of God's fierce anger upon sin had come crashing down on Jesus instead of on his people. This was the only way that God could destroy sin and not destroy his children whose hearts were full of sin. But not only that, at the very second Jesus died, the big heavy temple curtain ripped in two from the top to the bottom. The temple curtain separated the place in the temple where the normal people could go to worship God 
from the holiest of holies, which was where God's presence dwelt. And only the high priest was allowed in there, and only once a year. The people were separate from God because of their sin. But when Jesus died, the temple curtain ripped, because we no longer have to be separated from God because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Egg number six, please. Could you give that one to somebody else, Santiago? Bring it up to the front. There's some people up at the front just to let somebody else have it. Can you give it to Zuri? Let Zuri bring it up. Perfect. What have you got in it? Can you open it up? So what's that? I've got a blanket. Yeah, some white cloth. And do you know what that is? Enough. Smell it. Does it smell nice? Yeah. It's some spices. Perfect. Thank you. So there's some white cloth and some spices. Thank you. You can sit down. John 19, verse 40. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. Jesus had died. He was properly dead on the cross. It was not some pretense. He had died. And Joseph of Arimathea, who was a follower of Jesus, asked Pilate, could he take Jesus' body off the cross? When Jesus died, it was, it was a Friday. It was the day before the Jewish Sabbath and people weren't allowed to be buried on the Sabbath. So they wanted to take the body and bury it before the end of that day. Pilate agreed. So Joseph took the body along with Nicodemus, who if you've read in the, in the Bible, Jesus met with before. And they took the body and they took it down and they wrapped it in some strips of linen and, and along with some spices because dead bodies don't smell very nice. And they took it and they put it into Joseph's new tomb that had been cut out of a rock. They placed Jesus in, in the tomb. They buried him. Only dead people get buried. And they left. Imagine how Jesus' friends would have been feeling. We have the privilege that we know how the story ends. We know that it doesn't end on Good Friday. But imagine how Jesus' friends would have been feeling. This was the man that they had put their hope in. This was the man that they had put their trust in. And he was lying cold, dead, and buried in a tomb. How could he die? What had gone wrong? What did it mean? Was it the end? Imagine how much turmoil they were feeling. Egg number seven, please. All right, George, what have you got in here? Big loud voice. A stone. A stone. Do you see it? What is it, William? A stone. Brilliant. I'll take those. You guys can sit down. Super. Matthew 27, 59 to 60. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. They put him in the tomb and they sealed it with a stone. They rolled the big stone in front of the entrance so that no one could get in to steal Jesus' body. Then they left. Now remember the religious leaders who really did not like Jesus and were hoping that this would be the end of him? They really did want this to be the end of them because they didn't, they didn't like what he was teaching. But they were afraid that Jesus' followers would come back and pretend to steal the body or, and steal the body and pretend that Jesus had arisen because they'd stolen the body. They called Jesus the great deceiver and they were worried that this deception would be greater than all the other things that he'd said to try and deceive people before. Because they remembered that Jesus had said, after three days, I will rise again. So they went to Pilate and said, you know, we're a wee bit worried that the followers of Jesus will come and try and make, make it up that Jesus has risen from the dead. Can we make the, the grave, the tomb, as secure as we can possibly make it? And Pilate agreed. So they sealed the big stone, and Pilate gave them some soldiers as guards, and they were stationed outside the tomb to make sure that no one got in and no one got out. Egg number eight.
What is inside your egg? Nothing. Think nothing. Like, nothing. <laughs> it's empty. Thank you. This is the high point of the story, isn't it? It's empty. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in bright clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So it was very early on the morning of the third day, the Sunday, and Mary Magdalene and some other women had prepared spices to go to the tomb. They were fully expecting to find the dead body because they had brought the burial spices with them. But when they got there, they didn't find the body. There had been a violent earthquake because an angel from heaven had come down and rolled the stone away and was sitting on top of it. Do you remember those tough soldiers that Pilate had stationed outside the tomb? Well, when they saw this angel shining like lightning, they fell down on the ground like they were dead. These were hardy soldiers who weren't really afraid of anything, but they were absolutely terrified, so much so it seemed like they were dead. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. You'd be terrified if you saw somebody that looked like lightning, wouldn't you? But the angel said, don't be afraid. Why are you looking for somebody who is alive where you would normally find a dead person? They then they remembered, once they'd been reminded, that Jesus had said he would come back to life. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, but filled with joy. And suddenly, Jesus met them and greeted them. We sang that in our first hymn this morning, didn't, didn't we? See Mary weeping, where is he laid? As in sorrow she turned to the empty tomb, hearing a voice speaking her name. There was only one person in the world that said her name that way. Could it really be true? This Jesus that she'd seen die on the cross, that she'd seen be buried in a tomb, was standing in front of her, speaking to her. Dead people can't stand and dead people can't talk. Only people who are alive can stand up and speak. When Jesus greeted them, they fell at his feet and they worshiped him. Then Jesus told them to go and to tell his disciples the news that he was alive. And later Jesus appeared to his disciples and to other people as well. That's the wonderful thing about Easter, isn't it? I remember as a child being really confused about why Good Friday was called good, because Jesus died. But had it explained to me that it was good because it was the only way that we could be saved and that's what, what made it good. It's not actually good, it's ace, because we, as a result of it, receive God's grace. But it's not the end. The best news about Easter isn't that Jesus died and is still lying dead and buried in a tomb in Jerusalem. The best news about Easter is that the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. There is no body there because Jesus isn't dead. God had raised him to life again. Death couldn't defeat him. God is stronger than all the powers of evil and darkness and death and sin. And God raised Jesus to life again. Jesus' death has secured our forgiveness from sins because the, the, the blood of the innocent lamb was slain. But Jesus' resurrection, now that's just the fancy word for when he came back to life again, it has secured our life as friends with God, both here while we live on earth but also in eternity after we die. 
That's why it's so important. Jesus simply dying wasn't enough. If Jesus had stayed dead, we would have no hope. But Jesus is alive and he's living today. And we have hope and complete certainty that because of Jesus' resurrection, death is not the end. Jesus is the champion. He defeated death and sin. And when you believe that Jesus died for your sin to allow you to be friends with God, then you can have absolute certainty of God's help as you live your life on earth in a way that pleases him, but also life in heaven after you die. So when you go back to school or work tomorrow and somebody asks, what did you do yesterday? Or did you do anything for Easter? You can say, well, yeah, I did actually. I went to church and I heard about the, the Easter story. I don't really know anything about the Easter story. What's Easter really all about? Is it not really about the chocolate eggs and the chickens and the bunnies and the lambs and the hot cross buns? You can tell them no. All those are nice, but that's not what it's really about. The best thing about Easter is that Jesus is risen, sins are forgiven, and Jesus is alive. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I, Jesus, am the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever. But the Easter story poses a big question, that also, and it also shows us that there's only two responses to it. The question is, what are you going to do with this risen Jesus who is alive and seated at God's right hand in heaven, not lying cold and dead and buried in a tomb in Israel. What are you going to do with it? And the two responses are, are you going to be like the religious leaders who rejected Jesus at every opportunity that they could get and had their wicked plan so that they could get, try to get rid of him? Or are you going to be like the opposite of that? Are you going to be like the Roman centurion who watched Jesus die on the cross and said, surely this man is the son of God? Are you going to be like the women who fell at his feet and worshipped him as the risen saviour? Those are your choices. There's no sitting on the fence. You're either against Jesus or for Jesus. And I hope you've heard this morning that if you're for Jesus, you can have absolute confidence that he will forgive your sins and you can have the certainty of eternal life after him. If you've already made that decision, you have one more choice. Your choice is to keep the news to yourself or to be like the women that first Easter morning and run and tell people the best news that you'll ever hear. We're going to sing again. It's called, He Lives, He Lives, Jesus the Savior. We're gonna sing this and worship the God who is mighty, mighty, mighty to save.
Read, have a seat. Uh, we're, we're just going to try and pull it all together. It's a big, big story, a long, long story with uh, all sorts of different parts to it. And uh, we're just going to try and pull it together now and, and uh, see how the whole thing holds together. We're going to read just a, a few verses from the start of one of Paul's letters where he, he just packages all that uh, Rose has been telling us about into uh, 11 verses. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll put the words on the screen for you. Now, says Paul, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, the good news I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand by this gospel. You are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, namely, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Amen. Now, he's pulling it all together, and basically he has uh, three very simple words that he wants to get across to everyone that he's writing to, everyone that he's speaking to, and those three words are on the screen. Not down the side, but on the top. Jesus is risen, which means he's alive. He's someone that you can know, someone who's presence you can enjoy, whose strength you can draw on, Jesus is risen. And in the course of those 11 verses there, Paul says just these three things very briefly about that uh, amazing truth. Number one, it is vitally important. It's not just a kind of uh, interesting thing if you're kind of interested in those sort of things. This is hugely, hugely important. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are, how young you are, what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are at all. This is hugely important. It is of what he calls the first importance. Nothing, in other words, is more important than this. And, and what he means by that is simply uh, this, that, that if, it's, if it's not true, then, then you might as well just pack up and go home. Uh, you're wasting your time here. We really have nothing to say to you if that's not true. Um, but if it is true, then it is the most important truth in all of history. Um, it changes everything. Um, because if that's the truth, if Jesus is risen, if he was raised from the dead, then that tells you a huge amount about who he is. You can't afford to ignore someone who actually is able to stronger than death itself and is raised from that. You can't afford to ignore him. It tells you something about who he is. It tells you something about what he's done, that he has tackled on our behalf something that we, we simply could not get a handle on ourselves. He's dealt with all the deepest needs that we have. Uh, that's what he's done. And it tells you not just who he is, what he's done, but also why he matters. Because he and he alone is the one who provides us with forgiveness, who provides us with that hope of being able ourselves to enjoy uh, a power that is greater than death. So that's the first thing. It is hugely important. You rightly ask, but, but how do I know that it's true? I mean, yes, I can see that if it is true, then it, it would be pretty startling. It would be pretty important if Jesus is risen, he is alive, and he is who he said he is, and so on and so forth. I can see that that, that would be pretty important, but how do I know that it's true? So Paul is very obliging. He says, yeah, I, I understand you probably want to know the, the answer to that. And so in verses 3 to 8, he then goes on to uh, underline a second important thing about this. And that is not only that this is important, this is vitally important, it is also historically evidenced. In other words, you're not being asked to, to kind of just take on board something that uh, someone like Rose or someone like me says um, and, and just accept it because, hey, someone has said it. Um, this is something that is historically evidenced. There is a whole load of evidence that points to this being actually what happened. 
Um, remarkable as it may seem, unbelievable as you may think it is, because you think dead people don't rise. They don't come back to life when people are dead. They're dead. End of story, finito. Um, so how, how on earth am I, I meant to understand that this Jesus did come back from the dead? And Paul says, well, there are a whole load of different reasons why um, that actually is, is pretty compelling. There's the, the evidence of the tomb in which he was buried is empty. There's the evidence of people who, who saw him being there, buried there, people who knew him, um, and who then, after his death, were, were happy to tell the world, we have seen him alive as the one who was crucified, who was buried, and we have seen him alive. And they were prepared to, to go to death even for the truth of that. There's a whole load of different witnesses, Paul says, people who have seen him, people who, who met him, who encountered him, and uh, they're prepared to testify that that's the truth. See, it is, this, this is a whole swathe of different bits of evidence, so much so that a high court judge, and not just any high court judge, but in England, the Lord Chief Justice. That's, that's the kind of the cleverest, wisest, most righteous, as it were, judge who deals with bits of evidence day by day in his life. A man called Lord Darling. Um, I always think it must be nice to his wife, you know, um, when she addressed him. My Lord Darling. Um, but anyway, that's, that's by the by. Uh, this is what he said about the, the resurrection of Jesus. In its favor as living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. That's, that's pretty powerful from a high court judge who deals with evidence every single day of his life. And there he is saying, well, yeah, here's the evidence in relation to Jesus being raised from the dead. You want to look at that evidence and you want to consider that carefully because no intelligent jury in the world when faced with that evidence could possibly come to any other conclusion than, a, hey, however unlikely it may seem, however, however amazing it may be, however unique it may be, that's what actually happened. Jesus is raised from the dead. So that's the second thing that Paul is saying, verses 3 to 8. Number one, it's vitally important. Number two, it's historically evidenced. And then 9 to, to 11 in the passage there that I read, he says a third thing. And that is that it is personally life-changing. He's talking about himself and the impact upon him of the discovery that Jesus is risen. He is alive, and he has prevailed over death itself. He, he's saying, that's changed my life. And he, he points to the two main ways in which his life was changed. And uh, he does so in a way that is helpful for us because that's the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. That's the change that he makes in our lives as well. When we get a hold of this and we realize that this is really pretty important stuff, Jesus, who he is, what he's done, why he matters, uh, historically evidence like that, um, changed Paul's life in these two ways. You'll see, number one, uh, he revolutionized his character. Paul was a persecutor. He was a kind of um, a nasty sort of guy who, who, when he didn't agree with someone and didn't agree with someone profoundly, he just wanted to get rid of the person. And, and would stop at nothing to get rid of them. He'd put people in prison. He would be uh, uh, joining others to put people to death if he, if he didn't like them. That was the sort of guy that he was. Not a very pleasant sort of guy at all. Uh, he was quite a religious sort of guy, but that doesn't mean that you're also a pleasant guy. He was, he was not a pleasant guy at all. He was a, a nasty guy who was interested in himself and pushing himself forward. And this guy became, instead of being a persecutor, he became a proclaimer. He became a preacher. He became someone whose life was turned on its head. A revolution happened in his life, and he became an entirely different person whose life and whose living more and more reflected and was like that of Jesus. Jesus himself. Um, so that's the first change that he's pointing to in those uh, verses 9, 10, and 11 in the passage there. The second change, alongside revolutionizing his character, Paul says that what Jesus did, the, the risen living Jesus, he energized his service. Um, Paul was glad to live his life for the glory of God, glad to pour his energies day by day into the, the service of God, but he's saying that the one who really energized me is this Jesus, the one who is mighty, 
mighty, mighty, 11 times over, mighty to save. He is powerful, he is mighty, and he energizes me in all that I do. And when you read through the life of Paul and all the things that he did do, you begin to think, wow, uh, let me pause for breath. How on earth did he manage that? And Paul would say, I managed that because Jesus, the mighty one, is working in me, through me, and for me. Um, and, and he just changed Paul's life. And that's, that's what he wants everyone to understand as well. This Jesus does change our lives. It is vitally important. You, you really cannot afford to ignore this claim that is made about Jesus, those three words, Jesus is risen. Not complicated. A real person is, not was, is risen, beats death, alive vitally important. Uh, you can't afford to ignore that. You can't afford to ignore him. Uh, you rightly ask, uh, how can I be clear about that? The, the answer is that there's a load of evidence uh, in relation to that. And when you begin to see that, that that is actually, it all adds up, you begin to see, well, well, maybe you can change my life as well and change it in the way that he changed Paul's life. And, and that's what he does. He changes people's lives in the most wonderful, wonderful way. And, and we simply ask him to do that. Lord, um, I, I'm just glad that you are indeed the living, risen Lord. We have um, booklets at the back. Uh, they're not lengthy. We have them on the website as well. Uh, some are called Get Going. Uh, there's a whole pile of them there on the bookshelf, some at the, the welcome desk as well. And uh, that just gives you seven simple steps so that you can get going in terms of knowing this Jesus, following this Jesus, learning to love him and enjoy him as well. He, he makes a whole world of difference. And uh, his claim that uh, he is indeed the, the risen son of God is, is one that none of us can afford to ignore. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell what um, the, the message really is underlining for us. Jesus is risen hugely important, historically evidenced, and personally life-changing. Uh, may he change your life, and may you live that new life in his strength and for his glory. Let's just uh, round off with a, a prayer. And uh, as we do so, Lord, we, we want to say thank you, first of all, for all that you have come to do for us. Thank you that as we've run through the story today of all that you came to do, we, we begin to see something of how complete is the work that you, you've done. You've dealt with everything. So there's not a problem that we will face that you've not already handled and addressed. Thank you for that. Thank you that you, you help us day by day in all the, the other problems that come our way that we can look to you because you're risen, you're alive, you're around and you're someone that we too may know. And for those who've, who've never simply taken that step and, and simply looked to you and entrusted their life to you and, and asked you simply to be their king and turn to you as the one who alone is, is able to rescue them, would you help them today of uh, the best of all days, I suppose in some ways, Easter Sunday, to take that step to Make, make that commitment of their lives to you and start that life of trusting you, following you, enjoying you, serving you, and knowing your help and presence day by day. We want to pray for those who are in need at this time. We want to pray for all the people who are sad, all the people who are ill, all the people who are wondering where their next meal is going to come from, all the people who don't have a, a roof over their head and who wonder night by night where, where they're going to bed down. We want to pray, Father, for the people of Ukraine and ask that you would, you would simply bring that war to a quick and rightful conclusion so that it, it wouldn't drag on and, and day by day see so much destruction and so much harm and so much tragedy unfolding for so many families, Ukrainian families, Russian families, the experience of all the, the surrounding nations 
and the, the effect on, on everyone. Please help, Lord, and bring an end to that. And help us day by day to learn of you more and more, to follow you uh, the, the closer, and to be able to serve you with the strength and with the energy and with the power that uh, Paul was speaking about so that we may be able to share in telling others the good news about yourself. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us. Hear our prayers, receive our praise, and use us in your service. And we ask it for your own name's sake. Amen. Well, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there are goodie bags at the, the back for those of you who are primary age children, so don't miss out on that. Um, the, the bookstall at the back, uh, do have a browse through that. There are uh, a number of things that are just free for you if you, you want there at the back. Uh, our evening service tonight at half past six as usual. Uh, there is always a, a worksheet for the children. We want to encourage families to come out to that as well. And the worksheet for the children, it's, it's kind of eight sides of a worksheet, um, enables them to be covering the same ground so that uh, families are able to kind of talk it through, think it through together. But that's half past six this evening. Uh, worksheet's always available uh, on the website as well as at the, the welcome desk. We're going to round off our service this morning, though, by joining to sing one of the great Easter hymns, Thine Be the Glory. Let's uh, round off in style and giving to him our praise. Thine be the glory.
those of you who are really observant will have noticed the angels there made a kind of uh, unwarranted appearance in the middle of the hymn. Uh, it's like they were kind of pitching and saying, we want to be part of it as well. Kind of an extra appearing from the angels. Remember what the angels said to the, the women, don't be afraid. Maybe that's, maybe that's the Lord's last word to you in the back of this, whatever your circumstances are, do not be afraid. Why? He is risen. Go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And together, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.